little bit of background on uh, Reverend William J. Barber II. He's been called one of the most unique voices in American public life. Quote, the closest person we have to Martin Luther King Jr. in the words of Cornell West. He's president and senior lect lecturer of Repairs of the Breach. He's co-chair of the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival. He's a bishop with the Fellowship of Affirming Ministries, visiting professor at Union Theological Seminary, pastor of Greenleaf Christian Church in Goldsboro, North Carolina. He has also served as, pre as president of the North Carolina NAACP and is currently on the National NAACP Board of Directors. Finally, he's the author of four books, the most recent of which we are called to be of movement was published in June by Workmen Publishing. So with that, Dr. Barber, I wanna thank you very much for uh, giving us time and giving journalists time to help them understand these issues. Of course, I'm president, as you said, of Repairs of the Breach, which is a, a group that works on what we call moral artic analysis, moral articulation, and moral activism. We believe in moral fusion movement, bringing people together around our deepest moral, uh, either biblical or constitutional principles. And we are one of the co, we are the co-sponsor of the Poor People's Campaign along with the Kairos Center, where my co-chair is the Reverend Dr. Liz Theo Harris. The Poor People's Campaign started three years ago and in Ju on June 20th, after three years of organizing with people that you saw on the screen from the bottom up, we were organized from the bottom up, from the states up. We now have 46 coordinating committees in all over the country we have more than 200 partners that have come alongside us and more, 20, more than 20 different religious and denominational bodies. And on June 20th, we held the Mass Poor People's Assembly Moral March on Washington, a digital gathering. It was going to be on Pennsylvania Avenue, but when COVID hit and because of the devastating way in which power, uh, poor people and low income people are being hit by COVID, our uh, epidemiologists recommended that we not go in the street, but that we hold a digital gathering. In addition, we needed the stage because we weren't putting people up to speak on behalf of the poor. Our gathering, as you just saw, was to introduce people themselves who could tell their stories. But over 3 million people showed up, over 3 million people online and growing. And it was pushed out over 200 and some odd various Facebook platforms and the people from California to the Carolinas, as you saw Pamela Rush from Alabama, who actually uh, was in the hospital from COVID doing that. She succumbed to COVID, she died a week afterwards. Uh, but Pamela Rush from Alabama was one of the poor victims of COVID. But you also saw our dear sister, a, a farmer, white farmer from Kansas. So we work with folk from Appalachia to Alabama, from California to the Carolinas, from Michigan to Mississippi to Maine. Um, and we are clear, we really believe that there are five interlocking injustices, if you want to deal with systemic poverty, that you cannot ignore. And that is systemic racism in all of its forms, from voter suppression to police violence to the resegregation of public schools to continued mistreatment of our Latino brothers and sisters and the indigenous uh, brothers and sisters of the land, uh, systemic poverty, uh, ecological devastation and denial of health care, the war economy and, uh, and the false moral narrative of religious nationalism. We believe that they form what we call five interlocking injustices. Dr. King talked about three, poverty, racism, and materialism. We've listed five in this current moment that we're in that we have to address simultaneously. And we have to address with a deep moral fusion uh, um, uh, model that goes all the way back to the abolition movement that was black and white, all the way back to the reconstruction movement in the 19th century that was black and white and diverse. And one of the things we teach at, is that at our best, the greatest transformation in this country have come when we had deep moral intersectional movements that joined together. Um, we also have looked very carefully with our economists and others at um, uh, like Joseph Stiglitz, early on I met with him, Nobel Peace Prize economist, and, and talked to him about the cost or the price of inequality. Uh, we've produced several documents that I would want your reporters to know about. The first one is The Souls of Poor Folk. And you can get any of these by going to www.breachrepairs.org or www.poorpeoplescampaign.org. The Souls of Poor Folk, uh, auditing America 50 years after the Poor People's Campaign and the War on Poverty. 
then we produce the moral poverty budget, the moral poverty budget. And then we produced recently the moral platform for the healing of the nation um, that was just released. And we did our own congressional hearing and, and laid out a clear public policy agenda platform with a budget on how to address uh, these issues. We take these matters uh, very, very, very seriously. We have been able to bring together sociologists and economists with, with impacted people and theologians and historians uh, to, to address these issues because we know now uh, what policies and public commitments are needed to address the issue of systemic poverty. Uh, we had a Congress called Impact Moral Poverty Action Congress in 2019. Uh, over a thousand people came together, uh, religious leaders and impacted people and others. At that time, we were the first gathering that brought together 10 uh, people running for president. Uh, all of them promised that if they were, when they ran, they were going to put uh, poverty at the center. They were going to lift it up. So, of course, that didn't happen yet uh, because the consultants we found out actually advised presidential candidates not to talk about poverty. We actually had a presidential candidate to tell us that, that they advised them not to talk openly about poverty. And we have that on film, but we also have all of them on camera saying that this is, these issues must be uh, dealt with poverty and low wealth. We also presented a budget before the House Budget Committee. Uh, and we didn't do it as people on behalf of the poor, but poor and impacted people were there and presented. And one of the Republican senators while we was there got upset and said, I never read anywhere in the Bible where Jesus challenged Caesar. So I don't even know why you all are here. And our question back to him was, so you think you're Caesar? If you really think that you're Caesar, then America has some problems a lot bigger than we realized. Um, but what we, we know, we have the resources, but as the rapporteur from the UN said to us on one occasion, what we have not had is the moral movement, the wheel, and the kind of public media attention to the issue of poverty and low wealth, which is why I'm so moved. I'm almost in tears to be here today because one of our goals for the last three years was to shift the narrative, was to say you cannot leave these issues on the back burner. And why? Because this isn't about conservative and liberal. This isn't about right versus left. We're not a far left group or far right group. This is really about right versus wrong and about life versus death. It is the, the language of liberal and, and, and conservative is too puny to deal with the issues and the realities of poverty. Because before COVID, if you think about it, before COVID, we had, in terms of, of uh, 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 poverty, 140 million people living in poverty and low wealth. We used the, um, the rate, not just the government rate, but the uh, um, rate that also looks at the way other income factors into who's poor and who would be poor. Because you know, the rate that we use to measure poverty is so old that actually it ends up saying if you make $12,000 a year, you're not poor. Well, we know that is, this just doesn't make any, any, any sense. And so many economists and others are looking at the supplemental income measurement, which our public policy person, our attorney economist, Charlie Gupta Bond, actually uh, has written a major article on with others. But 140 million people living in poverty and low wealth, poverty and low income. Now, when you think about that, that's 43% of the nation before COVID. 43% of the nations, you heard Danny Glover said, either in poverty or $400 away from be having a major economic catastrophe. But that's also was 700 people a day. Columbia University did a study and they said that 700 people a day were dying from poverty and low wealth. Poverty and low wealth. That's the one, somebody every 2.5 minutes dying from poverty and low wealth. Now, what does that break down? Because we disaggregate numbers. That's 26 million black people were living in poverty and low wealth prior to COVID, 26 million. But when you look at that further, that's 60% of black people, 60% of black people living in poverty and low wealth. But the, we also, but, but in addition to that, that, that number 140 million included 66 million white people, 40 million more than black. But that, 40, that 66 million is 30% or so of white people. And the numbers continue when you look at indigenous community, Latinos community. That number includes 38 million children in the wealthiest nation in the world. 
It includes 62 million people who work every day for less than a living wage. Less than a living wage. You heard um, many of the people that were there talking about they're working and yet they're suffering from poverty in the film we showed. In addition, we knew that before COVID, there were 80 million people plus either uninsured or underinsured. And Harvard did a study that showed how many thousand people die for every 1 million people that are uninsured or underinsured. We knew before COVID that there were 4 million families, for instance, they could get up every morning and buy uh, unleaded gas, but couldn't buy unleaded water. 4 million families, not just in Flint. We also know that the military budget of nearly $800 billion combined, if you cut it in half, would still be more than the total expenditure of Russia, North Korea, China, Iraq, and Iran, even if you cut it in half. And we know that we have this, what we call distorted moral narrative of religious nationalism and so-called white evangelicalism that says that moral issues is not poverty, that poverty is just about people's individual morality. Instead, that, that distorted narrative teaches that the real moral issue is being against gay people, being, being for prayer in the school, being against a woman's right to choose, being for guns and being for tax cuts. And we as theologians have unpacked that. You know, I'm bishop with the College of Affirming Bishops is, that welcomes all people regardless of the race, their color, their creed, and their sexuality in, uh, directly. And also is engaged in orthodox evangelicalism, the evangelicalism of the Bible. That's what I identify as. One, the Bible, that, that form of evangelical says that true gospel theology starts with how we treat the poor, whether it's as the prophets like Isaiah, woe unto those who legislate evil and rob the poor of their rights, Isaiah 10, or Jesus, where Jesus says, I come to preach good news to the poor. And the word poor there is potokos in Greek. It means those who've been made poor by economic exploitation. And then on top of all of that, if I go back to racism for a second, we had that before COVID, 26 states since 2010 that have passed racist voter suppression laws. And I want to make a point here. There are a lot of other areas I'll talk to about in a minute about racism. But just on this case, this issue of racist voter suppression, we did a study and found that every state that was a low-wage state, every state that denied even the Affordable Act, every state that was hard and against labor rights was also a voter suppression state. And that the people that got elected by using race, because voter suppression is targeted at black people and brown people, once they got elected, uh, Brother Adams, they used their power, they used their power to pass policies that hurt mostly white people. Because in raw numbers, there are more white poor people than there are black people, not in percentage, but in raw numbers. That isn't often talked about. People don't often think about that that when you talk about racism, you're also talking about economics, that voter suppression may be targeted at black people, but when it's implemented and people are allowed to win offices using voter suppression, once they get in office, they pass policies or block policies that hurt all people, that hurt all people. And in raw numbers, more white people. That conversation has not been had. And Dr. King said in 1965, if we did have it, and you could begin to bring together black and white people, particularly out in the South, around the issue of poverty, who had been divided by the issue of race, because he, as he said, the aristocracy always sows division when there's the possibility of poor black folk and poor white folk coming together to change the, change the country and change the power structure. If that conversation is had, it could fundamentally shift the electoral politics in this country. Then COVID hit. And COVID has exposed for us to see what our uh, public health advisors say, the fissures and the wounds. Po COVID has exposed the fissures and the wounds caused by systemic racism and poverty in our To see not only the current administration, the president, but also that these wounds exist and the virus exploits these wounds. And that's why the numbers are so like they are when we look at who's being hurt the most. 
Yes, it's, it's disproportionately hurting black people, but it also is disproportionately hurting working poor people and poor people. And so COVID hit, and now we have 184,000 plus people dead, over 6 million people impact, uh, 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 affected. And when you break down that number of 184,000 people, 184,000 people dead, a whole lot of them, the majority of them, we are, are poor and low wealth people, people who've had to go, be essential workers who did not have sick leave, unemployment, living wages that have been forced to go into uh, lethal situations. We changed that name from service workers to essential workers, but did not give them the essentials that they needed. Now we have 30 plus million people who have applied for unemployment. Uh, on top of the already horrendous num level of poverty before COVID, 27 million additional people now are without health care uh, because when they lost their job, they lost their health care because we're the we're the only of the 25 wealthiest nations that connects health care to your job and not to your humanity and to your body. And so that means we're now over 114 million people that are uninsured or underinsured. We know one stat said that jobs that make $40,000 a year, that something like 40,000, 40% 40 of those jobs will be gone. We know that we poverty is going to rise over 43%. We're headed toward 50% of people li living in poverty, 50 plus percent of people living in poverty and low wealth. We're facing 40 million people being evicted, evicted, because we have not, with the, and the first two, three bills, the CARES Act, 80% of the money went to banks and corporations. The corporations even got $1.2 trillion that didn't even come through legislation. So the, we have the money. We've proven in this COVID uh, reality that we have the money, but we choose to still be operating either in voodoo economics, fund the top and it will come down, or this neoliberalism that says if you help the uh, middle class, it automatically helps everybody else, which is just not true. So we pass a CARES Act, and not one of those acts guarantees sick leave. Not one of them guarantees living wages. Not one of them really expands uh, 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 unemployment like it should have been. Not, not one of them provides rent forgiveness and rent and moratorium um, and, and, and mortgage forgiveness. And not one of them really ensures people that their utilities uh, will not be cut off for an extended period of time. And so poor and low wealth people in the midst of this are getting hurt. Now we have this so-called help bill that's being held up by McConnell. McConnell says, I'm not going to pass it. Despite all of this pain, all these millions of people that are hurting, I want another quarter billion dollars for uh, $250 billion for um, a quarter trillion dollars for tax cuts. I want a F-35 plane, some billions of dollars. I want liability for companies that did not protect their people. And all of this, while the wealthiest statistics tell us, have made $755 billion in the midst of COVID. And so we've had a negligent response of the government that has caused unfounded, unnecessary forms of death on top of a situation where 43% of the nation never have really come out of depression and denial who were dealing with poverty. And so here we are. And then in the midst of that, we find out from Columbia University that 69% at that time of the 150 uh, didn't have to die, didn't have to die. And then in the midst of all that, we have police violence these shootings on camera, lynching on camera. And you know the story of George Floyd, he, he was, a, he was a, a low wage worker, he lost his job, didn't have unemployment, didn't have sick leave, didn't have insurance, went to Minnesota to try to find a job, got a job, but it was essential job, still didn't have all those things. And when, by, by the time he ended up on that street corner, he was already being crushed by the systems and by poverty. And then this officer lynches him with his knee on camera. And the hero is the young girl that stayed there and wouldn't move and kept filming it. And then we get other deaths back to back. And in the midst of COVID, in the midst of people frustrated, in the midst of people at home, uh, uh, people, people came out. People said, no, we can't, we can't take this. And when we heard George Floyd say, I can't breathe, it was as if the democracy took a collective gasp. And so many people who've seen so much death during this period of time said, I can't breathe either. I can't breathe became 
compelling shorthand of America's enduring system of racism and poverty that endures and causes death in virtually every measure of well-being. I want you to hear that, those reporters. When we talk about poverty, all of the things that we do not fix that could address poverty have a death measurement. Denial of health care has a death measurement. Racism has a death measurement. Denial of wages has a death measurement. Uh, unemployment, denial of education, housing, all the water quality, air quality, land quality, environmental safety. They, these things wreak havoc in poor and low wealth, white communities and black communities and indigenous communities and Latino communities. And the reason is because we're all inextricably bound together. That's why it's, it, it, we cannot have reporting that simply says black and poverty as though black and poverty are somehow uh, uh, um, uh, uh, so, so, so connected that we don't talk about poverty in all of its ways and then disaggregate the numbers to show that poverty and low wealth is a dem the problem of our democracy. It is a problem at the very foundation of our democracy. Otto Swammer says uh, at MIT, one of the problems with our economic systems today is the system of consciousness. The system of the, 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 the under, excuse me, not the system of consciousness, but the failure to, to have a conscience and to understand how we're all connected together. And it doesn't have to be this way. As I close, Dr. King, a half a century ago, said in our society, poverty, he said, it is murder. Dr. King said this. He said, to deprive a person of a job or an income is a form of political murder. He said, he said that, and now millions of people are being strangled that way. I can't breathe is, is, is shorthand for how so many feel. And it's time we believe for what we call a moral revolution of values. It's not rooted in left versus right, Democrat versus Republican, uh, uh, liberal versus conservative, but rooted in our deepest religious values of our constitution, our declaration of independence, and our deepest religious values. And it's time for every piece of public policy to be examined by its death measurement. And if a piece, if, for instance, if denying health care has a death measurement, then we believe it violates uh, the, 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 the founding documents of the Declaration of Independence, which said we are, we are called to have life and liberty and the pursuit of happiness. And that same document says when there's been a long train of abuses, and there's been a long train of abuses when it comes to poverty, and systemic racism and ecological devastation in the war economy, that the people have a right to change that. But we have to face this. Denying living wages and basic income has a death measurement. 700 people die a day from poverty. Denying health care has a death measurement. And we have to address what we call necropolitics, the issue the business of who lives and who dies. That's what you're really dealing with when we decide to deal with the issue of poverty and not let it be seen as something on the margins. You cannot say any longer, America, that poverty is a marginal issue when 43% of people are poor and low wealth. And we have to embrace an agenda that, that's rooted in our fundamental principles, this establishing of justice and provoke, pr promoting the general welfare, providing for the common defense. Those are fundamental moral considerations that ought to be applied to every piece of public policy. That's what politicians swear to uphold. And you cannot fix the issue of poverty with just a generosity from churches. Poverty is an issue created by policy. And so we often get asked, well, what one demand is your top priority? And what we respond to that is we're not asking for one thing. We're demanding that this nation reconstruct everything. We're demanding for the sake of over half of the people in this country that we choose the politics of life and liberation and love. And, and we're insulted when somebody asks us what one thing do we want when we give the greedy three trillion things, three trillion things, and they don't even have to hardly fight for it. And so let me tell you what's possible, five minutes. If we instituted a $15 minimum wage immediately, it would raise it pay for 49 million workers would come up out of poverty and low wealth by $328 billion a year. And that money would be would go into the into the economy. If we did a housing wage, we would raise the pay for 83 million workers by more than a trillion dollars. 
If we ended mass incarceration the way we're doing it, we could significantly reduce the $179 billion that currently goes into policing in courts and prisons. If we stop pouring money and resources into our border wall, we could move 24, that $24 billion into children's K through 12 education and give life to their dreams. If we canceled one military contract, I want you to hear this, just one military contract, we could have $25 billion to expand Medicaid in the 14 states that haven't already done it under the Affordable Care Act. And as a footnote, all of the states that, that deny the Affordable Care Act are the same states and the governors that forced everybody to go back quick after COVID. Think about that. They, on the one hand, they deny health care, and, and the Affordable Care Act doesn't even take care of everybody. In my state of North Carolina, for instance, the Affordable Care Act would have taken care of 500,000 uh, North Carolinians, 346,000 white, 100 and some thousand black, 30 some thousand veterans. The, uh, uh, the, the so-called Republican legislature, extremists is what I call them, denied it. Now that North Carolina has a million people uninsured, but in other states like Georgia, they denied it too. And if you crunch the numbers, Texas has the highest level of denying health care, and then at the same time in the midst of COVID, telling people to go back to work. It is so, so uh, counter to what a deep moral focus ought to be. If we cancel that one military contract, we could create, uh, if we cancel some others, we could create jobs, infrastructure. Uh, if we cut the military budget by $350 billion, and close some of our 800 bases around the world. Uh, we, could, we could take that money and invest it in the country and in really taking care of the veterans because large amounts of our military budget does not go to the veterans, does not go to the soldiers. There are soldiers in this country on food stamps. It goes to the corporate war economy machinery. If we had put $604 trillion we poured into endless war since 9-11 into green energy, we could have built a renewable energy grid by now at nearly $2 trillion to spare. If we restored the corporate tax rate to what it was before the Trump tax cuts, we would raise $130 billion a year. This would be more than enough resources to fund the $100 billion we need to provide early child care and education for every child in this country. If we instituted a tiny tax on Wall Street trade, we would raise more than $70 billion we need to invest in free public college for all. If we taxed inherited wealth fairly, we would raise $700 billion per year, and this would, could give life to programs and policies designed to narrow the racial wealth gap, like baby bonds, that would, pub, would, that would establish a saving account with resources for every American. What we have we know the problem. We have the resources. The issue is having the will, which leads to this. We just did a study called Unleashing the Power, Voting Power of Poor and Low Wealth People with a professor from Columbia. And the reason we're organizing so hard and so deeply because 23 million poor and low income people who were eligible to vote in 2016 didn't. And we went to areas like Appalachia and we found that a lot of them that voted did not vote. They did not vote for Trump. In fact, the majority of people under $40,000 a year didn't vote for Trump. A lot of them just didn't vote. And when we asked them in places like Harlan County, Kentucky, why? They said, because we, first of all, voter suppression, but we never hear our names, our condition. We organized in Kentucky for the last couple of years brought people together from the, hill, from, the, from the hood to the holler, as we like to say. And they changed, turned three counties in that state from Republican to Democrat, and now they have a new government. And we never endorsed the candidate. We endorsed a set of issues. We, it's talked, we pushed poverty onto the agenda. We noted in Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, Michigan, that decided the presidential election by about 107,000 votes, 107,000 votes. In those three states alone, nearly 2 million poor and low income people didn't vote in 2016. We know right now from our study that in 16 states, in 16 states, poor and low wealth people, if you just organize between 1 and 20%, 1 and 20%, it actually is 1 and 19% in those states, you could fundamentally shift the elections, that the margin of victory could be changed if just 1% in Michigan and 19% in North Carolina of poor and low wealth people 
were registered and voted. And some of them, if they're already registered, but that, but that were voted. Poor and low wealth people now represent 25% of the electorate. 25% of the electorate, a quarter of the electorate. And in every state, even in the South, they have the power to fundamentally shift the political calculus all across this nation. And I believe that political parties that do not organize and speak to these people uh, and these communities are engaging in political suicide. But more importantly, they're engaging in the, in the undermining of our democracy. How can you not have the issue of poverty and low wealth as a centerpiece in any public policy discussion when it affects 43% of this nation and, in, and, and, up, and headed toward over 50% of this nation. And how can we not bring people together because every movement from the abolition movement to the women's suffrage movement, to the early union movement, to the civil rights movement, they were not black movements alone. All of those movements were intersectional movements. When people came together across race lines and geographical lines and formed unions, to help make this country a more perfect union.